Yeah, we want to make sure. Oh, could you like test it for a second? Oh, they want to say something. Microphone to be tested. Oh, he's supposed to talk in the microphone. Oh, cool. That's great. No, yeah, that's good. That's all right. No, just you. Just you. That's perfect. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. That good? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
that kind of introduction. Let's start by talking about protocol. So it's pretty unusual in a lecture of this type to give a two-part lecture where the parts have nothing to do with each other. That's what I'm going to do. It has a lot of benefit, actually. If you're falling asleep in the first part, I can wake you up again for the second part. Um, why are there two parts? Well, because there are two things I really wanted to talk about, and they have nothing to do with each other. One of them is the massive online course movement that a lot of people are greatly interested in and that I've been heavily involved with at Stanford. And I, but I didn't want to spend a whole hour on that. I think that deserves some discussion. But I also want to tell you about my research. So I've decided to do a half hour on research, a half hour on education. There's really nothing uh, tying them together. I have small bits of, of pieces I could talk about. Um, and I'm going to be pretty strict, which is I am going to stop the first part after a half an hour um, or 25 minutes or so, no matter where we are, so that I can do uh, the second part as well. Now, that said, I really like getting questions during the talk. So feel free to ask questions. and the time to make sure we get through both topics and everybody gets out of here in time. Okay? Everybody agree? That's the protocol. Okay, so let's start with the first part. And again, I'm going to keep a close eye on things. So if I keep looking at my watch, you know why. So I'm going to talk about data-centric human computation. And let me start by, at the very highest level, talking about mega trends in computer science research. So I think many of us will agree that the decade of the 2000s was the decade of the cloud. And there was a whole lot of excitement, a whole lot of work, and cloud is still incredibly important. Now we're in the 2010s, and I think we only need to change two letters to say what the mega trend in CS research is in 2010. Everybody know which letters they are? The L and the U, the crowd. So the crowd is permeating all kinds of subfields of computer science research right now. And I'm going to talk specifically about the data field, but we see it in a number of other fields as well. Uh, let me define uh, human computation, and I'm going to actually say this is sort of equivalent to crowdsourcing. I'm going to give you a definition that says human computation involves augmenting traditional computation with the use of human abilities to solve problems or subproblems that the computers can't solve effectively. So basically, we're going to use computers for the parts they're good at, we're going to use humans for the parts they're good at, and we're going to orchestrate the whole thing in good ways. So what are, have computers failed to solve well? Well, comparing images or telling us what's in an image or comparing objects that might be unstructured, information extraction, gathering certain types of data, relevance judgments, there's a lot of things that humans do much better than computers. So let's use humans for those. And I'm going to say again that you know crowdsourcing is a term that's quite broad. For, for this talk, let's just say crowd, human computation are all the same thing. Okay. So I'm going to lay out the a simplified picture of crowdsourcing research so I can tell you where I'm working in that, uh, in that landscape. So here at the bottom we have these are the crowd, and I'm sorry about the waves, apparently nothing we can do about that. So here's the crowd who's ready to do some work for us. They're going to do things that are hard for computers to do. And sitting above the crowd, managing sort of the interme being an intermediary between tasks that need to be done and the humans are marketplaces. And I'm going to give you the canonical example, which is Mechanical Turk. So most of you who think about micro-tasks that are performed by humans will think about Mechanical Turk as a platform where you can set up tasks you want humans to do. They'll come along and do them for you. Now, those marketplaces turn out to be extremely difficult to use for all kinds of reasons. So there's a whole bunch of research and, in fact, uh, commercial interest in building platforms that are much easier to use than using the marketplace directly. So these platforms deal with issues like what's the best interface when you're going to, to have the crowd do work for you? What kind of incentives can you provide so that you get good work or quick work? Um, what, what should you do about trusting certain users? Uh, spam is a huge problem with the crowd. You offer people to do a task, they'll just do anything and take the money. And how do you price tests and what are the effects of that? A lot of this work is being done in the area of human-computer interaction, but there's also basic theory to be done here as well. So now let's say we have a platform that helps us use the crowd in a relatively clean way. Above that, we might want to build algorithms. And you can think of a very simple algorithm like, I want to sort a set of objects, but the comparison function is performed by a human. So I'll have an algorithm that's a sorting algorithm, and I'll call the platform when I need to compare. 
Or I'll have, I want to filter a bunch of objects. The filtering predicate is something that only a human can do, maybe finding something in an image. So I'll have an algorithm that would call the platform, and I want a human to apply a filter for me. Okay? So those are basic operations performed by the platform, algorithms built out of those basic operations. And then on top of that, we might have a higher level uh, kind of functionality that's more like a database where you do data gathering or query answering. And that might call the algorithms to do things like sort or cluster or clean data. And that component might also call the platform, for example, to get data where a human is needed or ask a human to verify data, for example. So again, that's a fairly simplified landscape, but that's the one I'm going to use. And the work that I've done is mo falls largely in the algorithms and the data gathering query answering area. And I'm going to talk briefly about those two areas separately. Okay? So when we start working with the crowd, I think what's interesting is that we have new trade-offs that look to me at least quite different from trade-offs in any other area of computer science. And that's what makes these problems fresh and hard, I think. So one of them is latency. So we deal with latency with computers. How long does it take to do a disk seek? Using the crowd is a whole different type of latency. So that can be you know, minutes, hours. So we have to deal with, with that aspect of things and see how we can do things in a reasonable amount of time when we're waiting for humans. Second of all, there's cost. Now, when you ask a human to do a task, you're actually paying real dollars. And let me just give you an anecdote. So Amazon runs this EC2 computing service. They also run Mechanical Turk for crowdsourcing. At a university, I can go to Amazon and say, please donate computing time to me, and they will, because it doesn't really cost them much. If I go to Amazon and I say, please donate Mechanical Turk time to me, they'll say no. And the reason is because they have to pay real dollars to those workers. And so they can't be donating their <coughs> capabilities because it costs them real dollars. So now we're talking not about cost in some fuzzy way, we're talking about paying actual money. And the third component that fits into this is the component of uncertainty. So when you use humans for tasks, they're not going to give you the same answer every time like a computer will. They're imperfect, they may contradict each other, they may change their mind. Some of them may give you more reliable answers than others. So we have to work on the quality of the result. And there's a tension between all of these. If I pay more, maybe I'll get a faster answer or maybe I'll get a better answer. Uh, maybe I'll be willing to take a worse answer if it comes more quickly, and so on. So that this three-way trade-off comes up over and over again. Okay, so I'm going to start by doing a live experiment. You in the front row are now my workers, and I forgot to bring my, my change, but I, let's imagine that I'm paying you each, say, three cents to answer a question for me. And the question I have is, I'm going to show you a picture, and I want to know whether there are more than 40 dots. And you're going to answer pretty fast, because you don't have a lot of time to waste. And we'll try with the front row first. So are there more than 40 dots? Um, no. 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 Yes. 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 Ooh, I've got, what did I get? Three no's and two yeses? Was that what it was? OK, so now I use my workers for their micro tasks. They all made their five cents. I got three yeses and two no's. Okay, what's the answer? Yes or no? Yes, yes. Yes. Because I, was it three yeses and two no's or three no's and two yeses? Three yes. So I'm going to say yeah, the answer is yes because I got three yeses and only two no's. What if the no's, you were a no, right? A professor. So maybe his, maybe his no is actually better than the other no's, right? So maybe the other way around, it could be. Okay, so what is my answer, yes or no? I guess I should say yes. What's the confidence in that answer? Not that high if I got three yeses and two no's. Um, maybe I could ask more questions, right? What's the plus of asking more questions? I might get a better answer, higher accuracy, but it's going to cost me more to ask more questions and it's going to take longer. So I think just this one example gives you a flavor of the issues that we're dealing with. Okay, now I'm going to do another experiment. Let's use this side of the room, shall we? How about the uh, second row where we have a few people? Are more than half of the dots blue? There's my professor gets 10 cents for answering. No. No. No, no. More than half blue? Yes? Yes? No. No. Whoa, what do I have now? Three no's, three nesses. Oh, that's a hard one, but I guess I'll go with the higher quality of the... <laughs> Okay, so now I have another one. Uh-oh, now I have two filters. I want to know, are there more than 40 dots and are more than half the dots blue? I'm not going to ask you again. I think I've made the point about using the crowd already. But with, what happens when I have two filters? 
So in this case, should I ask the questions separately or together? Should I ask one person both of the questions, or should I ask different people different questions? Together might give me lower cost. People might be willing to do it for less than type twice the cost. It'll give me lower latency. I'll get answers faster, but maybe the accuracy won't be as good. If I ask them separately, should I ask them in sequence? Should I first ask one and then the other? Or should I ask them in parallel? And if I ask them in sequence, what order should I use? Because different filters are different. Um, actually, I think one of those filters was easier than the other, but I'll tell you the answer at the end of the talk about those. But they might have different costs. Also, it might be more expensive for someone to do a complicated filtering task than a very simple one. They might have different latency if some one is harder. Might be different accuracy in the results. Okay? So, the area of crowd algorithms, now that I've motivated it, is the area of designing fundamental algorithms that use human computation in some way. So we just did a filtering task that used humans to answer the question about the filters. So filtering is one example where the humans are answering the predicate. Um, as I already mentioned, sorting where the humans do the comparison function or say finding the top K from a large set where humans help us identify which ones are better than others are examples. And in order to develop an algorithm, we have to answer questions like, what questions should I ask the humans when I want to do it? Should I ask sequentially or in parallel? We've already been through this. How much redundancy? So maybe when I got those six answers and they tied, maybe I should go to the next row and ask another six. Um, how do I combine the answers and when do I stop? And again, this fundamental trade-off uh, comes into play in all of these algorithms. Okay. So we've looked at a bunch of algorithms, categorizing objects, filtering, finding the maximum object, doing sort of a deduplication task. And I'm just going to very briefly tell you just about one algorithm, just one slide, um, just to give you a sense of one problem. So in this problem, we want to filter a large set of objects, let's say S. Um, we want to apply a filter F. So it might be, you know, is there a sailboat in this photograph? And I have 7,000 photographs. Um, I'm only a human can answer the filter. I'm going to assume I have some known selectivity. Okay, so like you know, I'm expecting 30% to pass the filter, but I don't know which ones. And then I'll have a false positive rate and a false negative rate. So I'm just showing you, you know, a formalization of one of these problems. And our goal is to find a strategy for asking questions of humans that, in the particular case we address first guarantees some overall error. It says I have an error threshold and I want to make sure my expected error over all the items is less than that threshold. And then once, once I've met that threshold, I want to minimize my overall cost. And in, that, in this case, cost could be the number of questions I ask of humans. Now, I could flip the problem around. I could say I have a certain amount I want to pay and what I'd like to do is maximize my quality. And again, we're seeing that basic trade-off. Okay? So we actually set up the problem visually saying that we start at the origin and we ask a question, a strategy is depicted here, saying if I get a yes, I move here, I, I move, keep moving in the yellow, and if I reach a green dot, I'm going to answer yes, if I reach a red dot, I'm going to answer no. And that's just a pictorial strategy, a, pictor, a picture of a strategy that we might choose for asking a question. And I'm not going to go into the details at all, but to find a good strategy, we can do exhaustive search over the strategies. Um, there's some obvious things that we can do for pruning. Uh, you, there's some strange looking shapes that you would never, you would never want to choose because there's others that are obviously better. Actually, our best strategies happen to be probabilistic. But what I think I've just shown you here is taking crowdsourcing, which was probably this nebulous concept in many of your minds, and showing you that there's a very well-defined sort of familiar type computer science problem to solve. And there are tons of problems of that nature that have a new twist. Again, because of this latency, uncertainty, cost trade-off. So that's all I'm going to say about the algorithms box. Now I'm going to spend a little more time on the data gathering. Pause for a second, look at my watch and say I'm doing well, and ask if there's any questions yet. Yeah? What do you think are sort of the killer applications of crowdsourcing? Who do you yeah. expect to do the work and for how much? And right, yeah. Why does it matter? That is a great question, and I'm not, I don't have a good answer for that, and I ask that question all the time. Here's my answer. Um, it's a great research problem. We don't know yet what the killer applications are. You're never... Um, so let me do the second half of the talk, but I think one killer... Let me give an example. I want... Uh, I'm a journalist, and
and I am putting an article together, and I quickly want an image that matches my article, let's say. It's extremely hard to do that with Google Image Search if I have very particular needs. We actually built a tool, which I'm not talking about today, where you can start with a corpus and you can ask uh, humans to help you find the best image for your need by describing in some set of uh, predicates and ranking uh, criteria what you want. And you'll never be able to get that out of an automated system, I don't think, get the best one. Not a great example, but an example nevertheless. Okay, yeah? How can you say that uh, the problem is well uh, formulated when there is a human in the loop and I don't know the model of a human? Well, I gave you for that problem the model of false positive and false negative rate. So yes, I formulated a problem that is well formulated. Whether you believe that problem reflects human nature is another story. And we're definitely assuming a pretty good platform that's helping us, right? And, so, and I described a bunch of things the platform needs to do to help with incentives and trust and reputation. So yes, the problem I formulated assumed a false positive rate and a false negative rate for humans. Yep. Yes, last one. Isn't this a center so far uh, supervised learning? Like it's only an established concept in machine learning supervised learning. Like for example, if you have a database of images, uh, which you basically get rid of faces and not faces. You can do learning, but you can only get so far. In fact, I think the best strategy is to do machine learning followed by humans. Yeah, I think that's a great strategy. Okay, I'm going to move on now. I said I was going to be uh, strict about um, time, so I'd like to move on and talk about human-powered query answers. Okay? So now we're, going to, we're really going to switch gears away from algorithms, and we're going to turn to uh, my good old friend, the huge disk that we call the database management system. Database people always have large disks in their talk. So let's suppose that we have a database that contains information about countries, capitals of the countries, and the languages that are spoken in the country. Maybe it's a pretty small database. And what I'm going to talk about is how we can have a database-like system where humans help us answer queries and specifically gather data for us in response to queries. So if someone comes along and says, find the capitals of five Spanish-speaking countries, and I don't have five Spanish-speaking countries in my database, I could say, sorry, but what we're going to do is we're going to employ humans to help us fill up the database in order to answer our queries. And of course, we're going to want to do it in some kind of optimal way. So what would I ask those humans if I'm trying to answer this query? Well, I could say, give me a Spanish-speaking country, or I could have a country that's already in my database, but I don't know the capital, so I could ask for a capital of a country. Or I could ask what language do they speak in a country, or I could just say give me a country, maybe my database is empty, or give me a capital, I could start with. Um, or I could say I have a country capital language, is this actually correct? Because maybe some humans gave me some data that was incorrect and I want to double check it. Actually, all of those questions are useful. Or I could even go to the human and say, well, just answer the query for me. Um, give me the capital supplies of Spanish speaking countries. I'm going to assume that we can't do that. So I'm going to assume we want to use humans to do the small tasks that answer the big query. Okay, we do again need to deal with inconsistencies. So very likely there's some human that's going to come say that Brazil is a Spanish speaking country. They all be wrong. There are some humans that are going to misspell chili as chili, like chili peppers. So I'm going to have to deal with the fact that the data that comes in from the human is going to be dirty is going to be inconsistent. So key elements of what we did, we built a system. Um, we used the relational model in SQL. We decided we didn't need to de design a new data model or query language. Then we have fetch rules that describe how the database system goes to humans and obtains data. Okay? We have resolution rules that describe how to resolve inconsistencies in the data that we get. Um, query optimization, we use a traditional approach in the sense that we explore many different ways of answering queries. We have a cost model and we pick the one that we predict is going to be best, okay? With many new twists and challenges. And again, same old trade-offs come up, latency, cost, uncertainty. So the system is called DECO for declarative crowdsourcing. And let me just describe briefly how the system is used. So when someone wants to set up a database, that would be the schema designer or the database administrator. What do they have to do? They create a schema in the traditional fashion. I said they have a relation called, you know, with attributes country, capital, and language. It'll start out empty. Why not? We're going to crowdsource all our data, let's say. I mean, we could, of course, start pre-populated. But what we're going to do is define the schema designer fetch rules. And this is a little bit of an abstraction. 
that would say, for example, if I have a country and I want to get the capital, I call this function f1 with the country. Maybe I have a capital in a language and I want to get the country. It's kind of weird, but possible. I have a fetch rule that will do that. These, these procedures here are what I'm going to call the platform to go to the user to get the data. Okay? All right. And then we have resolution rules that describe how to resolve this inconsistency. So I might say, for example, when I get values for capital, I'm going to insist on getting a majority of at least five values. That says I'm going to get at least five people are going to tell me the capital. If I have a majority, I, that's what I'm going to use. If I don't, I'll ask for more data. Okay? There's many details I'm not giving here. Okay. So now we've set up the schema. We've set up the ways that we're going to fetch the data and how we're going to resolve it consistencies, and now we see what the user does, the application. Well, they just write queries in a familiar way. Okay, this is SQL. It says, I want to get the capital, uh, capital from my info table where the language is Spanish. Okay, so we're not inventing a new query language. Now, what's really tricky here it turns out to be the query semantics. Um, what we have defined is the notion of a valid instance of the database, and a valid instance of the database is the current state from whatever data I've gathered from queries in the past, plus any instance that I can get by fetching data from the user, more data, and resolving inconsistencies. Okay? So uh, if there's an unbounded number of valid instances based on a zero or more fetches followed by resolution. Now, one problem with that is that the empty database is a valid instance. So an answer to my query could just be, I don't know, I don't have any Spanish-speaking countries, so here's the answer. So we actually added the notion that we asked for a minimum number of tuples. And this says, okay, now I need to answer the query over a valid instance that gives me at least this number of tuples in my answer. Okay? So that's the basic idea, and that's the language. So now let me tell you briefly about the query processor. Of course, this is where all the work comes in. So we have a query we want to answer. We know we're probably going to have to fetch data from humans. We're going to have to resolve it. We're going to have to generate at least a certain number of tuples. And we want to generate a plan that does that for us. And what the plan is doing in this case is not you know, probing indexes and scanning disks or whatever. What it's actually doing is fetching data from humans and resolving inconsistencies. Okay? Um, there actually could be a bunch of different possible objectives, if you think about this, similar to the other problem. So one of them says, I want a certain threshold number of tuples and minimize the cost to get those. So find a query execution plan that has the fewest fetches in order to give me that number of tuples, or the fewest predicted fetches. Of course, you never really know what the humans are going to do, so you have to have some model predicting what they'll do. Or I could say I have a certain budget for fetches, maximize the number of tuples in my answer. If nobody gives me Spanish-speaking countries, I'll, my answer will have none, but I've used up my budget. Or maybe I have a certain amount of time. I'm going to say, all right, I'm willing to wait three minutes. Do the best you can. What do you want? Do you want more tuples? Do you want better quality data? Quality is, again, an issue that can come in. So there's a large number of objectives. And I'll just tell you our first system that we built is one objective. It says, I'm going to give a minimum number of tuples. I'm going to fix the quality. My resolution functions are going to tell me the quality I'm going to give you in the answer. And I'm going to minimize the cost in order to meet that quality for a certain number of tuples. And within minimi the minimal cost plans, I'll try to reduce latency. And by that, the way we achieve that is we do things in parallel, but only to the extent that we won't be wasting work. So we launch a bunch of parallel questions of humans, but we don't launch so many that we're going to exceed our cost. Okay? And the system is implemented, the first version of it, and we have a demo of it and just showing you the interface. So, I've done very well, um, because that is the whirlwind tour of what we're doing in the area of human computation. And again, we focus, these are sort of two separate things for now, we focus on algorithms where we're using the humans effectively as data processors, right? They're comparing things, they're filtering things for us. And then we're also focusing on a database-like system for data gathering and query act answering, where then the humans are really data providers. Now, of course, one thing, that, there are connections between these. For example, we might want to sort as part of a query, of a query processing plan, and we might call the humans to help us with that. So they're not completely separate. Okay, so I finished the first half of the talk with time for a few questions. I did want to mention that all of this is joint work with uh, my colleague Hector Garcia Molina at Stanford, with Alcas Palazotis at Santa Cruz, and with a couple of students. So, Couple of time for a couple of questions, and then I will change topics completely. Yes? What happens if you don't get answers that are acceptable 
and I am relying on the system to get my work done. Right. So um, you, so if you don't, I guess you made a mistake relying on the system. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, I mean, our model currently, the way we've defined it is that for the second system you're talking about, the query answering system, is that I insist on getting answers. And so I'm going to wait and wait and wait. And if I ask for a Spanish-speaking country and I'm asking a bunch of idiots who keep giving me wrong answers or contradictory answers, I will keep waiting. I'm going to minimize the cost to get that answer, but that cost could get very high. Of course, in practice, you do a timeout, right? But um, yes, you, the, there is in our system and our semantics the possibility of waiting an indefinite amount of time. Absolutely. Yep, probabilistically you won't, but there is a possibility of that. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah? Do you see the field of AI ever progressing to a point that outsourcing would no longer be useful? Um, you know, I, so is AI going to solve the information extraction problem for me perfectly? I doubt it. Of course I'm going to say no, I'm a database person. Um, there are some things that humans are always going to be better at, I assume. Uh, especially when it comes down to things that are sort of judgments, right? You know, are these two things really representing the same object or not? Um, and sometimes that's very difficult. So I'm going to say no. I'm going to say there are always things that humans are better at, but they also cost money and take longer. So you might prefer to use the AI method because it's cheaper and faster, but you will still get a better result, I think, in some domains by using humans. Yeah. Okay, uh, one, and that's it. And I'm going to be fiddling with my computer while you ask. Get my next the entire one. way to experts equal humans? Sorry? Is all the humans, is it equal or is it like even is it Oh, definitely you, not all humans are equal. And even Mechanical Turk has now introduced... Pardon? Well, okay. <laughs> Some humans are better at certain tasks and other humans are better at other tasks. How do you know? How do you know this? Yeah, so this is a very difficult issue. Um, practically speaking, you can give workers tasks that, that you know the answer to and see how they do and evaluate workers. There, there are techniques like that, I mean, very practical things. Um, there are crowdsourcing marketplaces that are higher end that really certify the capabilities of their workers, for example. So there are ways to address that. Oh, by the way, the answer about the dots. Um, yeah, sorry. There were 42 dots. Who said yes? Yes. And that was more than 40. And 20 of them were blue. So fewer than half were, were blue. So there you go. Okay. I will be happy to take more talks about human computation after the whole thing is done. Uh, after, I mean, if we have extra time or just personally after the talk. But I'm going to switch gears now entirely and tell you about uh, my experience scaling my teaching of introduction to databases from 100 students to 100,000 students. So most of the excitement I heard actually in the fall of 2011, but I'm going to tell you what happened, um, what's been happening since then. And again, I teach the regular introduction to databases class at Stanford, CS 145. Um, in the fall of 2011, I had 140 students in my class. As a small aside, I had 220 this year, but that's another story. So I had 140 students enrolled at Stanford. I also offered the class to the world for free. I had 60,000 students who enrolled at the start of the class, but to be honest about it, only 26,000 of them actually did some of the assignments, and only 6,500 did enough work uh, to get what we call the statement of accomplishments. So 6,500 did a significant fraction of the course. Did anybody in this room take the course? Did you get a statement of accomplishment? Yes. Oh, good. All right. Yeah, it's pretty common, actually, to find somebody. Oh, and I've been recognized on the street multiple times. I'll mention that. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's kind of um, Okay, so I ran the class in a structured fashion. Um, we left that website up for people to use until July of 2012, so just this, and then migrated it to a different platform. At that time, I just captured the statistics. 115,000 accounts had been gotten. Um, 480,000 submissions of assignments. So someone did assignment and submitted it for automatic grading, about 3.3 million video views, okay? So now let me give you a little history of what happened. 
So at Stanford, starting maybe 2008, 2009, we started getting interested in what we call the flipped classroom. And I'll explain the flipped classroom. The basic idea is students watch the lectures on their own time and they do your homework during the class. I prepared to do a flipped classroom. That was the first thing I did, which was to create the videos. And then I decided to put all my course materials online, the videos and additional materials. Um, that was the second step. And then the third was when I did the public course offering, and which is now called the MOOC, or Massive Open Online Course. So I'm going to talk about each of these. So the flipped classroom was motivated, at least for me and at Stanford, by a couple of factors. One of them was that I taught the course, course 15 times, an hour maybe more, and I stand up there and get the same lectures every year, and it's kind of boring for me and probably boring for the students. Second of all, at Stanford, many of our courses, including this one, are videoed. Um, the reason we do that is actually to offer it to industry people in the area, but those videos are put online, and one effect of that is that students don't come to class. So every class that has videos sees its attendance drop as low as 20% in the, in the busiest time of the quarter. So I was sitting there teaching the same class year after year, standing up and giving the same old lectures to a half-empty classroom. I was being videoed, and students were watching a video of me giving that lecture to the same old lecture in the half-empty classroom. So this just didn't seem like a great situation. So the flip classroom said, let's make um, videos that are actually purpose-made to be good videos for watching on your own, self-paced videos, and furthermore, put inside those videos little quizzes to keep people's attention. If they're going to watch a video, they might as well not watch me lecturing to a class. They might as well watch me talking twice as fast, uh, which I did, by the way. Um, they can always rewind or slow down or speed up. Um, and they might as well have quizzes in them to keep their attention. And then we turned class time into interactive activities. And I'll come back to, to what those activities were. OK. So just to give you a feeling for what it looked like, I guess the person in the back looked at all of it already. Here's an example of a video where I was giving a lecture. I actually did quite a few demos in my class. So I created this with a little webcam on the computer. I had a little tablet. I had PowerPoint prepared. And then I wrote on the PowerPoint as I talked. And that's me talking in the corner. So that's what these special purpose videos look like. And again, an hour, what usually took me an hour and a lecture would take about 30 minutes of video time. And the big length of the videos was whatever it took to capture the topic. It had nothing to do with a particular length of a lecture. Okay. And then I did a whole bunch of demos because databases sort of lend themselves to demos. So here's an example where I'm doing a live demo, but it's, it's video. Um, and again, you can see me in the corner. And then there were these, these quizzes that would pop up in the middle of the video. So you'd watch the video, and then this quiz would come up. You could skip it if you didn't want to do it, or you could choose the answer. And then there was also a little bit of an explanation. So again, definitely superior to just videoing in the classroom. OK, so what did we do in the classroom since the students were watching all these special purpose videos? Um, we did interactive problem solving. I'd come to the class with a hard problem. We'd do it together. I'd talk about it. People would try and we'd discuss it. Guest lectures from industry. I can tell you that having the first class, there's two choices for the first class. You, they can either hear me drone on as usual, or they can have engineers from Facebook and Twitter tell them how important data management is. Which do you think is more inspiring? Definitely the second one. Um, I have guest lectures also from people at Stanford who use databases, research presentations, a whole bunch of things that you usually can't squeeze in if you are doing your standard old lecture format. And then I also use some of the class time for help sessions or review sessions that would normally have been outside of class, because you have to be careful not to double the amount of time commitment of the students. Okay, that was step one, but you're almost interested in step three, so I'm going to try to get there fairly quickly. Step two, I finished making all those videos, and I put them out on the web, and then for anybody to use, I want to say, hey, great, if people want to teach from my course, that's great. So then I decided to put a bunch of exercises out there, too, to help people. If they want to use the materials and slides and scripts and all kinds of stuff. And that really was a complete course sitting out there on the web. I finished that in the summer of 2011, and thousands of people used that material. Okay, but the real excitement came when we decided to turn those online materials into a structured offering of a course that we would offer free to the world um, and that was, again, the fall of 2011. So what did I add to the materials I'd already done? I added a schedule with deadlines, so you need to finish these assignments by a certain amount of time. A lot of automated exercises. This was major. Um, and this really benefited the Stanford students, too. I did multiple choice online exams. Um, very important, I offered some tangible something at the end. We called it a statement of accomplishment. There was a lot of discussion about Stanford lawyers 
about what would be gotten at the end. Um, what they got was a PDF file uh, from me saying you did the course, here were your scores. Um, and it was not Stanford, it was me. Um, I got a lot of bitter complaining. Why doesn't it say Stanford? I took a Stanford course and someone else said, oh yes, it says Stanford everywhere. It says at the bottom, this is not a Stanford course. <laughs> 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 was the community aspect of having these students um, working together, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And of course, still free of charge, and that's what turned the thousands of students, thousands of people who were using my material into the tens of thousands who actually took the course. Okay, so let me talk a little bit more about the components of the course, and I'm probably, so I'm probably just going to careen through what I have to say, not too many questions, but if there's some clarification, ask me, um, and then I'm sure there'll be a bunch of questions at the end. So we did a bunch of automated exercises, and there were two types. One were quizzes, and the other were these interactively checked exercises. And actually, I'm going to put in a plug for a system called Gradients that my colleague Jeff Ullman developed over a decade ago. He was actually a real thought leader in online education, though most people don't know it because he was quiet about it. But he built a little, co um, actually a little company and partnered with a publisher called Gradients, which was just a quizzing system that turned out to be very effective where your content is a, each quiz is a bunch of questions and a bank of correct and incorrect answers. So you take some time to design them. And then associated with each incorrect answer is an explanation or a hint. And so each time you launch a quiz, you get a new version of the quiz. So to give you all the questions, it'll pick one correct answer out of the bank and three incorrect answers. If you choose an incorrect answer, it will give you the hint. And you can take these over and over, and each time it looks like a different quiz and is a different quiz. And I've actually been using that system for about, like I said, 10 years in my class. It's very popular. And students like it because they can also use it to practice. So even if they get the quiz right, they can do it four or five more times, and they'll get a different variation. So I had built up, over that 10 years, a huge amount of content of these quizzes. And so that was great to put online for the students, the, the tens of thousands of students. So I was lucky I had that because, again, it's very time consuming to build up that much quiz content. But I had that already. What I didn't have and that we did develop for the um, online course was automatically checked programming. There are actually some of that in the gradient system as well, but only for SQL. So I had a, a PhD student help me with this. I think these exercises you can't replicate in all fields of computer science. I think database are particularly good. So for all of these fit components of the course, relational algebra, SQL, triggers, views, also XML querying, um, we have exercises where we ask a problem, we give a schema or a database and ask a problem in English, you write the query, it checks whether you got the right answer, if it didn't, it explains why you got the wrong answer, and you do it over and over again. And there are extensive exercises for that as well, so very popular. Um, and I encourage students, both the standard students and the public students, to just do those over and over until they get a perfect score. And they do, and they learn a lot from that. Um, just to give a little picture, here's an example of a quiz. Um, and again, this, each time you launch the quiz, these questions would look different. Okay? The question would be the same, I should say. The choices of answers will be different. Okay? And that's pretty important. Here's an example of the programming exercise. I guess this one is XML. So we explain the database, and then we ask you to write a query, and you put it in, and you press the check button. Now, I got pretty involved when I did the public class in fall of 2011. I had great fun with it, um, and I spent a lot of time on it. And I did um, add a personal touch to the class, which I think made a difference to, to the students. So I actually made a weekly video. Um, we called it the screen side chat. I don't know if you know about FDR and his fireside chats, but he talks to, to the country, I think once a week or a month or something like that, sitting by a fire. So anyway, this is my screen side chat with the fire there. Once a week I would go on and I would, you know, talk a little bit about what students are doing well and what they're not doing well and what they could skip and still go on with the class, sometimes logistical things. And it would typically be about 10 minutes. So we put it on YouTube and most of the students would watch it. Um, when Thanksgiving came around, I had a little turkey there, um, and then Christmas here at the end of the class, even though it doesn't snow where I am or where you are. But anyway, I did definitely get involved in the, in the class personally, and I think that was fun. Um, interesting effects of doing a class with this many students is everything has to be perfect. 
So I thought 100 or 200 Stanford students could debug a class materials. No way compared to having tens of thousands of students. So everything, even the nuance of what I said in the video, did you say any or all? And there could be huge discussion of that, of, of small nuances there. And any mistake, I actually made a mistake in the final exam. Probably the student who took it doesn't know that. But that was a real problem. So anyway, every mis tiny mistake or ambiguity gets greatly magnified. Okay, so what's happening back at Stanford? I'm making the screen side chats. I'm making everything perfect. The Stanford students really like the automated exercises. They really like the perfection. Why wouldn't they? Um, so then everybody says, okay, what's their added value for tuition? And then there's all these students who are doing it for free. Stanford students are paying a large amount of money. Um, what are they getting? So I'll tell you about this course. There's a whole other discussion about what students are getting from attending a residential university, which is a much bigger question. But the students in this course, the Stanford students who were taking this course got much more than the public students. So they got the in-class activities and lectures that I described. They did, I did give extra challenging written exercises to the Stanford students that were graded by hand. They had a programming project and real exams. Of course, then the public students looked at the website and started complaining, why don't we have the programming project? But um, anyway, that was what the, uh, the Stanford students got. And I'll just say right off, I've taught the class enough times that I know what kind of evaluations I get for the class, and they did go up. So the Stanford students did like it better. There were some complaints, but most large majority of them preferred the new format. Okay, now let's talk about the public students. So the public students were amazingly appreciative of the class, and this is sort of what kept me going because it was a lot of work. I got flowers, I got chocolates, I got people who said that I changed their life. Um, you can't read these, but this, this is a snapshot of the discussion forum, and this first one is people introducing themselves, the high school dropout, the 75-year-old, the 13-year-old, there are all kinds of people from all kinds of countries. I do have online a survey that shows who the people are. Um, this middle one is people just thanking me for the course, saying I'm a rock star, and so on. Um, and then this third one is a person who wrote a poem. And <laughs> she was crying when it was over, so um, it's pretty amazing, actually. And another amazing thing is that out of those tens of thousands, a top, a clear top student emerged, way better than all the other students, uh, at least in this particular style. So this student, we had this question and answer forum where students could post questions and other students would answer, and we, the staff would monitor it a little bit, but we didn't need to monitor it because we had Amy. And she answered 900 questions in, in the um, duration of the course. Um, she answered hard questions. She answered dumb questions. She was always polite. Her English was perfect. Her answers, sometimes she would give little examples to substantiate her answers. Really amazing. Um, here is some discussion of Amy uh, among the students, just saying, please reveal who you are. We all want to know. You know, thank you so much. And then this one is actually a marriage proposal. Um, <laughs> Give me more exercise, and I'm saying you're getting this for free, and you're but there are complainers. Um, I talked to a, a faculty member at Berkeley who did a course who was so depressed by the complainers he didn't want to do it again. And I kept saying, just don't, you know, if you have this many people, you're going to have complainers, and it's really important to ignore them. So it's hard not to feel attacked when people are telling you you're doing a terrible job, even if you're doing it for free and you don't think you're doing a terrible job. But anyway, there are going to be complainers when you're at this scope, and anybody who's looked on any discussion forum of any type on the web knows there are going to be bad apples who are going to appear, and you just have to try to ignore them. The second one is cheaters, and um, 
I decided not to consider this a downside. I went through the whole experience. I said, people want cheap, that's fine. They're getting this PDF statement of accomplishment. They could edit it anyway, right? Actually, when someone complained about it not saying Stanford, someone else said, just edit and put the Stanford seal on there. And while you're there, change your scores. So, um, so how did I know there were cheaters? I knew there were cheaters because some people finished the final exam with a perfect score in two minutes. And the only way that happens is if they get multiple accounts. And there's no question that people were getting multiple accounts and using some of their accounts to learn the material and then some to get the best statement of accomplishment. Now most of the exercises you could do over and over again, so everybody could get a perfect score on those, but the exams you could only do once, and that's how I know there were cheaters. But I just said, I don't care, that's not something I'm going to deal with. Um, but if one gets into certification in this area, then one has to deal with the cheaters. Okay. So what's happened since the fall of 2011? Well, everybody knows there's a lot of interest from colleges and universities, and I say of all persuasions. There's interest from some universities or colleges that are worried they're going to be put out of business. There is no question about that. So that's not a, a, a good interest, but they're very interested. There is interest from some universities, even like public universities in a large western state, that think they're going to make money from this. Um, and that's a different type of interest. Their interest in just uh, increasing reputation. So there's lots of interest of different types, let's say. There are also startups that are building platforms, as well as content, actually. Um, there's two already out of Stanford and a third one coming. Um, there are nonprofit startups. There are for-profit startups. There's a huge amount of debate between nonprofit and, and for-profit. Um, there are now hundreds of these massive open online classes. Um, I happen to be a, doing a second offering of my class right now. I just started it, and I'm doing it on a different platform. I'm doing it on a platform that we're building inside of Stanford, just sort of for fun. And I do have, I have 55,000 or something sign-ups, but we'll see how many actually complete the course. I think I had 16,000 submit the first assignment. Um, and there's a huge amount of press, like every week the New York Times is writing something uh, about this topic. So, and I'm sure everybody in this room is interested too. And I would say there's no obvious direction. I really don't think we know where this is going at all. So I'll just close with some questions that people in the university might ask about this. Um, you're probably thinking of them, a selected subset of questions. Um, one question, by the way, is who owns a course? Uh, the university or a professor, that turns out to be a major question that nobody really thought about before. Now people are thinking very hard about. And different universities have different answers for that question. Um, I happen to be the department chair. Should we be giving teaching credit for people putting courses online? Um, should we be giving them money? Should we even give them a TA? Uh, right now we're not giving extra teaching credit. We're not giving money, but we are trying to give some TA support where we can for doing this. But it's not clear, um, you know, who's responsible for course production again? Should the university be providing money for course production? It's not cheap. If you're going to do a good job at it, what about the hosting? Um, get into some more general questions. Is it a university's mission to educate the whole world or not? Um, if everything's online, why are people paying 50000 a year to go to college? That's another question. Uh, and I guess this is the final one. Uh, what's the future of higher education? Okay, so, wow, I did really well as far as time goes, so I'd be happy to entertain any questions about uh, the second half of the talk or the first half. Yes? Uh, for the programming assignments, what sort of feedback did the students Right, so for the programming assignments, a simple example would be a SQL query. So they're asked to write a query, um, they write one against the wrong answer, and it tells what answer they should have gotten. So just it, it says, you got this, you should have gotten this. Okay. Some of them, like triggers, are a little more complicated because the checking mechanism will actually update the database, which invokes some triggers, and then the triggers run and there's queries afterwards. So that's a little more complicated. But it's, that's the mechanism. And I should say right up front that you, with that feedback, you can circumvent the system easily. If you see what the right answer is, you could write a query that basically, in SQL, for example, just selects all the data that has those values. And I put in a little warning saying, I know you can circumvent the system. If you do that, you get a high score, but you won't learn anything. So, yeah. Um, so I don't think too many people circumvented to get just to get a high score. But I'm sure not too many means only a few hundred, right, in this context. I mean, literally. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. I would speculate that if uh, it was advertised that instead of you standing here and giving us this talk, 
Uh, this talk will be online and uh, will substitute for Hans sitting here. I wonder if you think uh, that you'll get from UCLA, from our department, you'll get uh, this crowd, smaller crowd, or bigger crowd? Oh, for this particular for talk? this particular course. So if, if, if the answer is what I think is probably nobody would have looked, uh, have looked at it, or close to very few, what is the extra thing that we, 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 we get by seeing you in person rather than in video? Right, yeah, so um, the main thing that you, well, first of all, video is a lot easier. Well, okay, what are the advantages of seeing you in person? The primary advantage is you can ask me questions. Maybe that's the only advantage. Does anybody have any other answer to that? The, the upside of video is that you can rewind me or you can speed me up. When I watch me, which I do sometimes to check on something, I watch me at 1.5. If you think I'm talking fast now, you should hear me at 1.5. I don't, I'll ask, ask you, what's the advantage for you being here? That you could just ask me a question, right? Yeah, probably uh, you say that you can ask questions in the middle. There is the immediacy of right. something that makes it completely different experience. In right. the same vein, I don't know, until now, now that I have a 70 inch TV, I perhaps, uh, perhaps you watch a movie at home, but until now, I went to the movie theater. It's a completely different experience well, watching a movie right. in the movie theater and at home. Yeah, so well, so, this so is not let me address that in two, with two separate situations. One is the flipped classroom in a university. In the flipped classroom in the university, the first 15 times I taught the class, the students came and they listened to me lecture. And they'd ask a few questions. In the new version, they watch the lectures on a video. If they have questions, they're going to need to come to my office hours. But when they come to the class, they're interacting with me. I know the students much better now. So I think that the, for the setting of a university class, this flipping of the classroom is probably a really good idea. It's probably an improvement for almost all the students. Because they're still interacting with me. I'm still there, and they're doing things that are more interactive than just a lecture. But then the question is comparing the MOOC to being in a class. Well, the MOOC is, you know, I think is clearly inferior. All you get is video. You don't get to ask questions. The exercises are limited to things that can be automatically checked. So does that answer your question? Yeah, well, sort of. But in general, I think that perhaps uh, uh, we know that uh, in, start, in learning, uh, there is an emotion involved. Without, uh, there is, um, and uh, uh, I think that the element of emotion is there more when you, you, you see a person and it's a real right. person rather than a video, which is... Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with that entirely. And I don't think anybody's going to argue that a MOOC is as good as a live class. I don't think anybody will say that. What it does, though, is reach a lot of people who can't be in the live class. And I think that's how you have to look at it. So I would never argue that it's better. Um, I mean, there's so, like I said, there's some nice things about watching a lecture and video because you can rewind it and things like that. But the oh, to me, the course as a whole unit is going to be better to take a real course than take a MOOC. No question about it. Yeah. Perhaps a different way, a better way to ask the question is what is the age or the maturity of the student required to take full advantage of the online class? So of course, you cannot. You cannot give an online class. Kindergarten, not even junior, not even high school. Well, wait, 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 wait. So no, you know where this all started? It was with the Khan Academy in high school. And that was high school fine, and middle fine, school. Fine, but and and those students are getting a ton out of it. Those students who go to the Khan Academy get 10 minutes of a tutorial on something they didn't understand. Kindergarten, too? Probably. Well, I don't no, know. No, no, I don't yeah, I don't, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, I do want to acknowledge, by the way, the Khan Academy, which was really the sort of front runner in this. And if you're not familiar with it, it's uh, a guy who made a huge number of videos mostly targeting high school math, science, and so on. It's widely used for, for extra help. Yes. Do we have enough experience to make a claim that uh, flip class and so on produces actually better? Yes. So uh, I will just say up front, I, do, I, have, I have no evidence about improvements in educational outcomes. I'm not an education person. And I, it bothers me a little that computer scientists are going around thinking they're education people because they're not. The real understanding of how this is affecting things has to happen from people who are professionals in education. I can say anecdotally, I think my students learned a little better. But I have no, because they did a little better on the exams, but it was different exams, right? So I cannot, I cannot 
argue that, and I'm not going to try to. Um, there's a great interest in gathering a lot of data. One thing I will say is on these websites, every time you click, it's long. So we have, and you know, every time you try an assignment and how long you spent on each video, everything is long. So there's a wealth of big data for the education people to analyze, although I think they're overwhelmed at this point. Don't I have one more question. Yeah. You had the last question, what's going to happen with higher education? Right. Yeah. Do you have an Do you, answer? Uh, no. Oh, well, I sorry. have a question related to this. Do you think if we go full force into this, that we have a chance to have another Donald Knuth to write nine volumes? Uh, would he be yes. motivated, interested, would it, there are needs for this? Because people get 15 minutes struggling on whatever they want. So my abstract for my talk said I refuse to speculate on that topic. Okay. Yep. I don't think Stanford and UCLA aren't going to go away. I mean, that's my well, opinion. Don't worry, I'm going to go away. <laughs> there was a question here and a question there, and I'm going to let John decide when we end the whole thing. Um, Just the quizzes, but I had separate exercises. I was wondering because I'm mostly from education, also I'm teaching private course at the University, um, online and uh, interactive. And we are using a lot of essays and many different multiple ways to, uh, to test people on their competition, on retention, on all sorts of things. Um, and uh, multiple choice not as in the case of our choice, and we don't really like to test them with multiple choice. We would like them to actually. Yep. And, and so, in essays, what, what kind of deal is Okay, everybody ready for me to tie together the two halves of my talk? Okay. Here it comes. Um, if you are going to do something that requires a human to grade it, right? Like an essay, like a human, uh, so we did, a, Stanford did a class on human computer interfaces, where you design interfaces. If you're going to do something where a human is going to be needed to grade it, the only way to do it at scale is to have peer grading which is to have other students in the class who are grading their peers. Okay, that's the only way you're going to scale it. That's a crowdsourcing problem or a human computation problem. So you actually need to figure out the quality, the latency, the cost of having the peers grade the assignments. So actually in our human computer interaction class that was taught at Stanford, they did peer grading where five students graded every assignment and then they had a few that were graded by the TAs to get a gold standard and compare how people were doing. And they captured all the data. So actually in my research group, we are doing a little project where we are using that data. We have the whole transcript of that. And we're proving that with our algorithms, we can reduce the number of peer grading events by about 30% without lowering the quality. That comes way back to that filtering slide. So I'm now connected for you. Crowdsourcing and, uh, and human computation, I mean human computation and online education in a fun way. So you have, if you're going to scale it, you're going to, either you're going to hire you know, 300 TAs in, in India at a very low rate, or you're going to have students grade each other, and you're going to have a lot of redundancy so that you get decent quality, and the cost is how much they're willing to grade. A model, very intuitive, seat of the pants. What the student, when the students smiled and when they frowned, that was about it. Yeah, uh, not nearly to that point. I really am not an education professional, um, and I'm not a great teacher. Um, you know, I'm sort of an average teacher. Um, so I just seat of the pants. Right. There's, but like I said, this area should keep education professionals busy for a very long time. One, two, and again, John, you're going to tell me when to cut off. Yeah. Um, are you using the students that takes your class for the, uh, for the research you talk about, like to provide some data for your research? Are you using the students, your students, like uh, you say that? Well, so we did for our research in human computation, where we're doing, we're evaluating this peer grading problem, which is actually kind of a categorization problem. You want to take each assignment and categorize it into a grade. We have data from a MOOC. So ten, you know, tens of uh, ten thousand students or so, and what grades they assign, and we're replaying that data, uh, but it's uh, it's anonymized, obviously. Yeah. So we are using that data, not from the Stanford, which is way too small, mm -hmm. but from the public. Outsourcing to some unemployed people. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to look at this problem from a different angle. Uh, what traditionally we say well, I should take small classes, 
the teacher has education on what your questions are and some customized material and all that. And with this big massive uh, way of broadcasting your education, certainly a good thing, you get to reach to the public, but on the other hand, the personalization well, actually, you're, 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 many people think that this is the medium in which it's going to be totally personalized. A really good online class will have all kinds of different pathways and how you answer one quiz question might determine which direction you go. Um, and furthermore, no longer do you have to have a class unit called Introduction to Databases. Maybe you want the SQL part and you want to couple that with data mining and something else. So you can have customized classes with small modules. So, both personalized class content and personalized pathways through the material, most people think will be enabled by this rather than disabled. Now, the other part of personal, like we're talking to each other, obviously they're not going to get. So, but, but customized for the individual student, this is very promising, right? You, you pass the first quiz with 100%, forget the next five quizzes, right? But if you don't, you're gonna do more until you get it. Right? You do, and yeah, and again, education people and CS people are pretty interested in that. Yeah. I think there was one more. I don't know if you want to let the man So, one of the things you said confirms something that I worry about. So, when, when I teach, I try to do it in a Socratic way and ask a lot of questions right. and make the students come back. And, and I'm very concerned, I've always been concerned about making the course more available, for example, either video or even audio tape, which I make very easy. Because right. my concern is that. If there's an alternative way of getting it, like listening to the tape or watching videos, so the students aren't going to come to class. And you said that things dropped off quite a bit. My concern is that I think it's really different watching, you know, just watching something rather than being there. And, and, and I'm concerned that if, if I make it easier in some sense for students not to show up, they're going to suffer. So my question right. is, am I just a dinosaur or am I, am I no, right? Let's, let's, no, you're not, so first of all, I want to set the baseline, which was the situation at Stanford where our lectures were being recorded for another purpose, but were being put online, and 80% of the students would watch the lectures online instead of coming to class. That's the baseline when we started two years ago. Now I'm saying, okay, you watch those videos. Oh, they're much, the videos are so much better than the ones you used to watch. Come to class, and I will ask you questions because we'll work on problems together. Now, I have to say that I did require students to come to some minimum number of classes because they were so used to not coming, I wanted to make them come. So this quarter, last quarter, I required them to come to like eight classes. Most people came to more than that. And then we did interact. I did ask them questions much more richly than I did in the past. So, um, so I don't think it's a, it's a negative that this is going down a bad route as far as interaction. I think if properly managed, in fact, the students will be more inspired to come to class, hopefully. Right. But it's all still in its infancy, so I, I don't think we know what will happen at the end. Okay, let us thank our speaker.